So uh, my partner Brad had, had enough that, that those two um, failures were enough for him, and so he joined Sam Sal and went to work for Sam, and I started a company called Inner Workings in September of 2001. Just as the Twin Towers were going down, we hung a shingle up for business. And the idea about Inner Workings was to use technology to really help people. We, um, when, we were in the, when we were in the promotional products industry, the inherent problem of that business is it was virtually unlimited views. You could put a logo on anything. I tell people today, you know, people don't realize how many things are printed. I mean, in fact, M&Ms are printed. Like, you can put a logo on anything. Uh, the SKU count was virtually unlimited, and yet the manufacturing base was fairly small, which means the manufacturer had all the power. In the printing industry, uh, it's the exact opposite. The SKU count is actually very small. One could argue it's a SKU count of two, paper and ink. Uh, but it's a very small SKU count. There's maybe 20,000 SKUs total in printing. And the manufacturing base is very large. It's a huge number of manufacturers, 40,000 printers in the United States. So, I, by, you know, uh, I was talking to a print broker one day, and by luck realized that you know, I kind of had the right idea with Starbelly, but in the wrong space. And so we started this company called Interworkings to essentially do the same thing in a totally different industry. And um, we, we took all the lessons, everything that went well at Starbelly, we repeated, and everything that didn't go well, we avoided, which, um, which actually sounds uh, simple, but it's, uh, it's not easy to do. We did that, and so we built, uh, instead of building huge systems and hiring tons of people, we built very small systems and hired very few people, made sure they worked, and that business began to take off pretty quickly. Real revenues, real profits, and by you know, 2005, it had become a pretty sizable business, maybe. Uh, it went from like zero in revenue to five million to 13 to 30 to 70, something like that. It had become a pretty decent sized business. And so we were about to take it public, which we did in 2006. Um, and then Brad uh, came back and said, you know, I've had enough working for uh, Sam. I want to do something entrepreneurial again. So him and I started thinking about businesses to launch and decided, why don't we try to tackle the freight marketplace? Uh, essentially see if we could build a, build a technology that we could try to find the right truck moving in the right direction at the right moment in time. We started, and it was, you know, most of the businesses we started are born out of some personal experience. So for me, I was now in the printing industry, and I'm trying to figure out how to make all this product and get it somewhere. And you know, some large percentage of the time, we kill ourselves to print the catalogs or books or magazines or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, we'd call the freight brokers or the trucking companies to pick it up, and it would never not get there on time, or there wouldn't be good information, or some disaster would ensue. So we thought, well, look, why don't we try to take technology and apply it to that space and see if we can automate it. We launched Echo in uh, 2005, February 2005, and it grew even faster than dinner workings. It went from like 7 million to 30 million to 100 million to whatever. It's just growing like crazy. Um, and we took that public in 08, I think, or 08 or 09, a couple years ago. Um, so now here we are. I'm going to rewind for a minute. So we have inner workings, which is public. Echo is really doing well. In June of 2006, I started thinking for some reason about the media uh, marketplace. I got, and I, and, I, and I can't begin to tell you why, I just started thinking about media. And I started thinking, well, we now have this expertise at building these almost mini exchanges where we're going out and we're making markets in, in, in industries that don't have a ton of visibility, like the printing industry or the transportation industry. And that's really what we were doing. We were finding arbitrage by brokering print or brokering transportation using technology as this kind of platform by which we could figure out who had open capacity or where trucks were. And I thought, why don't we try to take that, that discipline and apply it toward uh, the media industry, right? Because people are buying media all the time, and it's very inefficient. You know, I think I read somewhere that this famous Wanamaker quote, you know, half every dollar I spend on advertising is wasted, I just don't know which half. And I thought, that's a horrible industry, right? So why don't we try and figure out how to make it uh, more transparent? So we launched Media Bank in June of 2006, and pretty soon realized that we couldn't tackle that market the same way we did with Interworkings and Echo. Because essentially, the problem with media is that it's almost like, a, it's like trying to launch a cable company with no, with no cable lines, or trying to launch a phone company with no coaxial cable lines. 
there's just you know, there's, there were no copy of the letters, right? There's no, there was no connectivity between publisher and advertiser. The language people used was different. Every system was different. Nothing talked to each other. And so it was impossible for us to use technology to kind of you know, make that market more efficient. So what we needed to do was really fill the pipes. And so we pivoted from our original idea for Media Bank. And in early 07, we set about to build a smart router of media, a back office system that could be used by any publisher and any advertiser, analog and digital, to essentially buy media. And, and quietly, without anyone knowing, Media Bank now routes about $50 million of media. Um, we handle about 20% of the entire U.S. advertising industry. Um, and so this has become a really powerful company. If you say to, you know, if you were talking to Palmer and you said, have you heard of Interworkers or Echo? He would say no. Because if you heard of Media Bank, he'd say yeah. Because, right? you know, anytime you're touching that much media, the, you know, the, the, uh, the big media companies are are focused and, and so Media Bank has really done this really well. It's kind of taken off. It's uh, it's a private company. It's doing great. And then in 2000 and uh, in 2007, I now have these three companies up and running. And this guy named Andrew Mason approached me, or actually uh, approached somebody else. He had been working for me at Interworkings. Um, he had left to get his graduate degree in Chicago. I called the guy that was working with me and said, "Hey, I have this idea." Then eventually called me, or I called him, we ended up talking about it. He pitched me the idea, which was to build a site that used the power of tipping points to solve problems on the internet. Like, I want to build a park, but you know, it's hard for me to get all my neighbors to commit to building a park. If I could conditionally agree to give 100 bucks, if and only if all my neighbors gave 100 bucks, I would be much more willing to do it. So I looked around and thought, you know, this is pretty cool. This doesn't really exist on the internet. I haven't seen anything like it. And at the time, I was kind of fascinated with companies like YouTube and all these consumer-oriented businesses that were using the power of social graph to take off. And so I said, look, why don't you drop out of school? Why don't you drop out of school, and I'll put a million bucks in, and let's you know, we'll do it. And he thought I was nuts, right? Um, and he's like, OK. And so he did. We did. And, um, and that was we, we did that for about 18 months up until October, uh, September, October of 2008. And at that time, it became apparent that the point was not working. That you know the, we just weren't we just weren't getting traffic. There was no advertising revenue at all, and the business was kind of stuck. And so we started to really you know put a lot of pressure on ourselves and the team to try and figure out how we could monetize the core asset of the 